more demanding uh, than um, faith and suffering, uh, pain and evil, um, and, uh, and all the, the host of questions that each of those topics involve. Um, but uh, I think uh, in this case, you know, there's a number of different places where we can start, right? Um, and uh, I guess, I think it's probably in some ways appropriate to start uh, from the beginning. Um, uh, in some ways, actually, almost quite literally, from Genesis 1. And uh, I think I was, I was glad that the way that the, the questions were posed initially uh, here on this, uh, on this slide, um, each of these questions, I think, have a response. Uh, whether they're satisfactory or not, who knows? Um, but uh, I think at the center of all these, faith is, uh, is necessary. Um, I think for all of us, uh, the question of suffering uh, pain already strikes a very personal chord. Uh, not just simply an intellectual one, uh, but a personal one. Uh, now, in my case, uh, I hope I actually have enough, speaking of intellectual, steam left. Uh, in fact, this past week at the college, um, in one of the courses that I teach on uh, sociology and deviance, we covered suicide bombing, serial killers, mass murders, and um, yeah. the like. So it has not been a light week, <laughs> uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, and so in this case, I think everything that we've discussed uh, bears upon stuff that's very, very important questions for us yeah. uh, and for the world at large um, and uh, for our place in it. Um, but uh, I think in this case, the, the personal aspect of it is one that needs to be brought to the fore. Um, because uh, that's, of course, where uh, at times um, our minds and our bodies uh, have a very difficult time catching up, right? Uh, or coping with uh, the things that are most taxing in this world. Now, in my case, I've always been interested in questions uh, about pain and suffering, and many of them stemming from personal experiences. Um, I think that's probably the case for all of us. Most of us probably were not in second or third grade and, and reading books about theodicy. Uh, that is, you know, they didn't present us in elementary school with, how can you justify the existence of an all-powerful and all-good God and in the face of this evil. Um, uh, in some cases, we simply experienced evil and pain and suffering, uh, and at most of the time without, of course, much discussion um, or justification or explanation um, for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, now, I recall in my case, uh, one experience that always stuck out to me, uh, and it's one that, uh, that in many ways uh, informed my faith when I was quite young. Uh, and when I was a teenager, uh, uh, growing up, in Miami, Florida, uh, in uh, the area that I grew up in Miami, Florida, uh, the, uh, that, that point of the crack epidemic was actually something that was very real and had a very real impact on the minority community that I was a part of. Um, and you obviously notice the way that I'll actually speak and address some of these issues will be as a sociologist. That's what I'm trained uh, in doing, um, right? In some ways, I'm kind of a self-taught theologian and uh, I'm a sociologist of religion. Um, so in some ways, I kind of crossed quite a bit of different paths in my discipline. Uh, but my main perspective is social. Um, and uh, so events like this stick out in my mind all, all the more. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there was a friend of mine, uh, to kind of make a long story short, that also had a tragic ending. Um, there was a friend of mine who, uh, who I received a phone call uh, from him, I remember early on in the evening on a Saturday, uh, stating that he was going to go hang out with a few other friends about 10 or 15 minutes away, and asked whether we, I and a few other friends wanted to join him. Uh, we told him, no, we're going to go hang out at such and such party uh, in this place, and then we're just simply going to hang out at another friend's house afterwards, uh, I suppose, until we all fall asleep. Um, and uh, about an hour later, we got a phone call uh, with one of our friends, kind of almost uh, semi-hysterical, um, in the phone stating that uh, one of these friends of ours, his name is Jorge, uh, we called him Brace, um, had been shot. Um, and uh, in this case, we're, you know, they, to this day, we're no, none of us know what happened to him. Uh, we know that a, a weapon was found in the car that he was in, um, and uh, whether, right, some people stated he did it to himself mistakenly, and others said that the, 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 the guys who were in the car with him were actual rivals and were simply kind of buttering up to him, uh, shot him. Um, the, uh, I'll spare you the details, but he was unrecognizable. Um, in uh, many respects. And I remember going to the wake, and at that time it was the first wake that I had ever attended, um, and it was a very, very, very dark occasion. Um, and uh, sure enough, yeah, when I approached his body, uh, he was, he did not look like the brace that I knew uh, in any way, shape, or form. His entire, entire right side of his head and his face uh, had been almost completely deformed. 
um, and be kind of reconstructed uh, for the event. Uh, but I remember the, the mother, after I walked through there, the mother walked in and almost knocked over the casket. Uh, she was in such despair, and she was holding up her hand trying to grab a, a crucifix that was up on the wall behind the casket. Um, and I remember thinking, it shook me to the core. Mm. Um, and I simply said, and thought, what? it was quite surreal. Um, and I didn't quite know, what have we gotten ourselves into? It was kind of a question that I was asking myself and my friends were asking one another. Um, and sure enough, when we went outside, we can tell that there's quite a bit of immaturity in our own selves. There were other friends who were there who were playing around with the little placard outside of the funeral home, uh, jumping up and off the walls. I mean, it, was, it showed me in many ways that we, we don't know how to come to grips with, this, uh, with these kinds of tragedies. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, of course, that was uh, quite a bit of time uh, has passed from, from then to now, and quite a bit of other challenging situations have arisen, as they have for myself and for any of us. Um, but that, that, that first question is an important one to ask. Um, you know, why is there, obviously there's, there's one, at one point we could actually uh, um, make a distinction, oops, let me go back here for a second. Just got trained in this, oh, actually let's play the corner. There we go. I want to make a distinction here between pain and suffering. Pain and suffering. Um, now, I think in the, in the case of pain, all of us know quite well what that feels like. Suffering, perhaps enter into another register, right? To another level of experience that isn't simply a matter of, I actually touched something that burnt my hand. I put my hand on the range. <laughs> uh, or I fell off my bike. Or I tripped over uh, a curb. Uh, like all these things that in many ways testify to the fact that we are animals, right? That we are fragile dependent beings um, who are not, in this sense, right, all-powerful and capable of resisting. Right? I think on the one hand, there is a, you can see the great wisdom in this. We are beings that are supposed to be affected by the world in which we're embedded. Right? Otherwise, I'm not quite sure why you want to feel pain. <laughs> right? And in a sense, we do want to feel it. Right, I mean, there's, there, well, there's several, right, of course, medically documented conditions where right, nerve endings don't work properly and people do not feel pain. Right, uh, you may read about some cases of, of actually young children, right, putting their hands on ranges and burners and don't feel it. Right, they smell burning flesh, but they don't know it's, it's theirs. Um, in that case, pain may be a gift, and it is a gift, right? Now, uh, we would want pain to signal to us that there's something seriously amiss, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And we ought to back away, right? However, there are, of course, other situations where pain doesn't really seem to seize. It almost seems to actually be the sort of pain that makes you, as a human being, feel helpless, powerless, right? And drained. And that, probably, once we, that, that, when, when we experience that sort of thing, we are entering, I think, the realm of suffering. Of suffering. Right? Perhaps even something like despair or anguish. Right? So pain, I think, right, by itself can be a great gift. All of us know, of course, if we work out, if we do exercise, we are deliberately right, inviting pain. <laughs> right? And we know, I mean, even physiologically speaking, we know what's going on. We're tearing our muscles. We're doing actually things to our body in order to build it back up. Um, so in this case, pain also right, can play a very constructive role. Right? And this is separate from the issue of death, which we're not necessarily focusing on that, on life and death per se. Right? But uh, there's, there, there is a, a sense in which we have to almost in some ways embrace this aspect of life that I think can be named quite well, I think, with this term. Not tips at the restaurant. Right? But there's a certain gratuitousness to life. Right? There's a certain sense in which there's so much out there. Right? there. We are so open to so many things. And most of these things, I think we would say, are beautiful things. Right? Air, <laughs> trees, right? the entire environment, other human beings, other animals. Right? There's, there, there's an aspect to all of this right? that life is filled with gratuity. It is gratuitous through and through. Filled with freedom. And I think what the Genesis 1 account 
makes clear and is a very important element in suffering is being interconnected. Right? In fact, right, we can, uh, right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read, right, I'll skip around in Genesis 1, and you can simply listen to this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. In verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And so it was, and it was so, God called the expanse sky. When we move over, to, of course, to verse 9, he then separates, makes another separation and an expanse, and dry ground appears. Uh, right Then after that, verse 11, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. Down to verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. There's already rhythm uh, and patterns of, of uh, right, and sequence that's actually built into creation and the created order. In verse 20, And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Verse 24, And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. Down in verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God had created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. That's about as gratuitous as you can get. What did you say? Right, the human being in this case isn't sealed in some kind of habitat necessarily, right? Well, he's completely dependent on it. But God opens it up, right, all to him. And each of these places to one another, right? First he creates all these spheres, and then he fills them with living things that all live and are connected with one another. All made, right, by the same God. You can see that in the contrast here with Mesopotamian origin myths, um, right, even including Enuma Elish, right, and some other areas, right, where the human beings were the result of warring gods. And usually it was out of the byproduct of warring gods, who claimed that, in that case, human beings were simply there to serve as slaves and workers for the gods and to build temples for them. A narrative like this, of course, introduces the idea that there's actually a deity that sticks his hands in dirt, breathes life into them, and gives them life in a place to enjoy. Right? Yeah. So this is all thoroughly gratuitous. I mean, this is all donated. This is given, just as we are given to the world and it's given to us, right? Yeah. Unless somehow we all arranged their births, <laughs> right? But we didn't. We simply came into the world, right? Yeah. From the very beginning in its origin, it's gratuitous, it's, right, it's filled with this freedom that God grants the living things to live here, and there's interconnectedness. The interconnectedness, of course, is a great point, and freedom when it comes to suffering. Right? And all the while, everything we do every day is completely suffused, completely permeated by the gratuity of God. From, the very, from beginning to end. Every time you and I eat, we're reminded that something had to die so that we live. And that applies to the omnivores and the vegetarians amongst us. The plant is a living thing. Right? So all these things have now given up their life so that we integrate it to our life. Mm. Right, I guess you see something like simply like eating. <laughs> it's interesting, of course, that the entire narrative here, right, of the curse between Adam and Eve and God happens in a moment of eating. Of all the possible scenarios, just eating something off of a tree. <laughs> right? But the whole point, I think, here is that um, from the very beginning, it's important to understand, we're going to think about pain and suffering, and in particular suffering. Um, the assumption, I think, at least scripturally speaking, is one that helps us to think that we are already living in a world that's teeming with freedom, 
with a gratuitous, right, over-the-top excessive giving from God to people. Um, and all of these things are connected with one another and therefore can actually help and love one another or hurt and destroy one another. Right, so we're not necessarily isolated, right? Yeah. So that, that, that's, that's where we start out. Pain, on the one hand, of course, can be very helpful, and it needs to be. Right? We want to know when we're being burned. We want to know when we've harmed our arms. And we want to know when we're harming somebody else. Right? But at the same time, there's another level, of course, of this that deals with suffering. When it now it's not really simply a matter of, hmm, there's a lot of pain going on here. But the pain is of something altogether different. Uh, or maybe not necessarily altogether different, but it's at, it's at another level. Right? And it's much more demanding than anything else. Right? In this case, I think it's important then to uh, distinguish between certain different kinds of suffering. Okay? Um, and in this case, right, there is, there is something to be, uh, oh, let me erase some of these things here. All right. Yeah, I'd like to distinguish between something that we could call historical or historically imposed suffering. Right, another kind of suffering, I'll just kind of I'll call it body, right, or natural suffering, even though that's got a certain limitations. Something that I can call some moral suffering. Right, all these kinds of suffering are things that are not just simply now an issue of pain, a moment of pain, right, but one that now can actually com completely alter you as a human being. Right? In this case, historical suffering or historically imposed suffering, which is a very top, wow, that's really bad handwriting. Okay, I hope you can read that. <laughs> All right? Bodily or naturally su natural suffering and moral suffering. Now, the, very, the second one there, right, we understand, of course, we have very fragile bodies. And this, of course, strikes very, very close, right? Because we know that disease, especially something like cancer, is prevalent in the world and most certainly is prevalent in the United States, um, right, and anywhere else. Right? Disease, is, is, disease is something that is very, very tough to grapple with. Now, we know that, of course, what follows from this particular narrative, what ends up happening, of course, after this, is that we know that the relationship between human beings and the earth and between the human beings and God um, isn't in a sense where it's supposed to be. Um, and, uh, and a lot of this, of course, due, in many ways, right, to decisions, right, to our own lives that, that human beings have constructed on the earth uh, that have very much caused harm to bodies. Right, into the very meetings that we live in, both in the ocean, the air, cities, right, all of these things. Now, in Romans 8, uh, right, we can read, uh, I'll read a passage here for you. Eventually, when I start losing my voice, I'll ask all of you to start reading from somewhere like Job. When we arrive at Job. Right, Romans 8. Here we go. Verse 18. And he actually uses that term. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation awaits an eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The statement in verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Right, now, this is an interesting statement, right, because if he claims that we are not the only ones waiting for some kind of complete upheaval and transformation of life to newness, but creation itself is waiting for it. So every tree and rock and blade of grass and every animal also awaits this kind of transformation. 
Now this, of course, speaks directly, of course, to that kind of ecological, even interconnected understanding right, of creation where harm on one end will cause harm on the other end. Right? There isn't, in a sense, not necessarily any sort of isolated harm. Um, and I think you would probably understand this quite well. Uh, sometimes people mention uh, the butterfly effect. All right, the fluttering of, of wings in one area right, causes a tsunami in another, right, and such claims like that. But the whole point here, of course, is that globally speaking, uh, right, in life on Earth, we are very well, we are very much connected. And we are given, right, to this realm of death. We are given uh, to this. And the answer, in some senses, here is that also, it's not simply a question of God, what is going on with our bodies? But it's also a hopeful question is what can happen to our bodies? What has happened to our body? Notice here that he doesn't say that this is all fake, right? He doesn't, he doesn't write it off as that's not real suffering. It's real suffering, right? We feel it. It hurts us. There are some of us in this room, we, right, we struggle with our own health, right? But in some ways here, right, the, the, the main question really it, it pertains to what is going on with the earth? Why is it also affected, right, by a lot of, the, in this case, death-dealing ways and harmful ways, right, that human beings Right, have on the earth. Because right, if you remember from the Genesis 1 narrative, right, it, it says, human beings who have been made in my image take care of the earth, right? It's actually it's presented as a garden. Go and tend my garden. And if you tend it well, there'll be life and there's enough food for everything, right? Enough food for everything and everyone. That clearly has not been the case. Right? Now, so in many ways, right, we know on the one hand there's bodily suffering because we, we, we do have fragile bodies. And as much as human beings like to challenge mortality, right, we specialize in coming up with recreational activities. Let me see how close I can get to death. So much fun. Right? Face jumping. Man, that's so much fun. Parachuting. Fun, right? <laughs> and then they had UFC. Terrific! <laughs> right? So, in some ways, here, right, we invite pummelings and danger and risk. Because somehow, getting that close to death is quite the high for us. Mm. But it can cause great harm, right? Somehow, wanting to eat just about anything that we want at whatever pace that we want is fun. But it has certain drawbacks in the human body, right? And it's just simply an honest admission. Like that's, it certainly does. So there's, there's, in this case, there's a lot of quite a bit of natural bodily suffering, where uh, the main questions that have to be asked and the main actions that have to be undertaken have primarily to do with how well do we actually live into the Genesis narrative? Do we really know that I was given all of this great gift gratuitously? And all these things around here that fill up this earth. Do I live in this narrative? Or do I live in another? Right? That doesn't necessarily see this as all that fragile. But perhaps as much more astute and tough <laughs> uh, as it actually is. Which is, right? Which is, in some ways, right? Uh, our own bodies can withstand a lot. And they do a lot of wear and tear. But they can't do it forever. Mm. They can do it a lot. Right? But that suffering is most certainly real. Um, now... The last one there, mortal <coughs> suffering, is usually, is where I think I've come across this category and I've thought of it, and this is actually the kind of suffering where we suffer for others, right? So this, in many ways, right, it's connected to that element, this Genesis 1 element of interconnectedness, right? Moral suffering is one where we see the harm that's coming to others, we see others are suffering in disease or sickness or ailment, and we feel it with them, right? It's that one thing that for sure testifies to the fact that we are animals that can can, can actually exercise empathy. We can be sympathetic. We have, we have to fill with compassion. And that's important in a world where I know I'm depending on you <laughs> and you and you and you and all these other things to live. Right? Compassion actually serves a very, very good purpose there, right, in my everyday life and, of course, in understanding life in general. Now, the one at the top, historical suffering or historically imposed suffering, is something that, of course, figures very greatly in Scripture, along with everything else. And this one makes suffering in many ways what it is. Right? In some senses, right, the suffering, right, the questions that were posed at the beginning there on the, on, on the first slide, 
Why is it that some suffering completely takes you out? It completely drains you of power and of strength, while others can actually enrich you and strengthen you and toughen you up. And in this case, I'm not necessarily talking about bodily training as in athletics and so forth, because I think there we can easily see. But even, even there, there's an element of that, that that also figures into this response. But there's, there's, I think there's a few key things, but there's one key thing that separates one from the other. And, it's, and I think it's captured in the word imposed. If it's imposed, what, what were you not playing a role in? It's a choice. Right? It's amazing to us what a difference it is whether it's imposed or we welcome it. Right? All of us know what it feels like. Do 50 more of those push-ups. No! Versus, I'm going to do 50 more of those push-ups. Right? All of us know the very, di very, very big, big difference between our own volition and choice and imposition. Right? Yeah. Now, of course, when it comes to something like, right, with an immediate or obvious payoffs, usually, like working out and training the body, doing something that actually imposes suffering on others, and has nothing to do with an immediate payoff, it actually has to do with manipulating them and using them, that's an altogether other effect. And that's where historically imposed suffering becomes a very, very real and powerful issue. Right? And in this case, right, this can occur, of course, at a number of different levels. And I think this is where also scripture brings the language of sin. Okay? Let me erase this. Now we want to ask ourselves, why? Why, why does this suffering occur? What is the proper response? To this suffering, what are all the different kinds of responses, right, that can occur with respect to suffering? And in here, right, I could add, a, I could add a few different, right, possibilities. But when it comes to sin, uh, it's very clear from Scripture that it comes out at a number of different levels. It can be personal, right? It also seems like it can be quite social, and it can literally be built into the structure of the world. And notice, of course, later on in Genesis, right, later on in Genesis, there's a, right, God makes an observation about life uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, of course, in verse, uh, Genesis 6, verse 1, when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. The days will be 120 years. Then skip over to verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. Now, in this case, right, he identifies harm as coming from human beings. But he includes all the other animals along with them. Right? And surely enough, once the flood, a narrative of the flood comes through, on the back end, God re, re, right, redoes the covenant with the humans and every living thing, he says. Right? So they're all, everyone's included. Not just human beings. Every, everything is included here. But notice that he makes a generalization. He's like, God, why are you generalizing? He says, all these humans are literally bent on violence on simply harming one another. The ways of life that they have developed is simply bent on taking advantage of one another, exploiting one another, and harming one another. Right? I mean, this is not, he doesn't just pick out individuals, right? He says, everybody's living like this. Every people group, at that time, every nomadic group, every, they're bent on taking advantage of one another and others. Right? And he thought, this, is, this simply cannot be, and you can actually see the pain that God feels. Right? This is certainly not the Greek or Hellenistic God filled with divine apathia. Right? He does not want to be a God like Zeus and the others who, we have our issues to deal with, human beings will deal with theirs. Or they will be the pawns in our dramas. No, in this case, God is intimately, as we know from Genesis 1, is the one who actually planted them in the garden. And I was wondering, why are they living like this? So the suffering is there and it's real to him as it is to all of these. Right? But it could be social 
And he can even be to the point where it's structural as well. It's literally built it in to the institutions of family, economy, government, education. Does something like slavery in the Jim Crow South apply? Yes. This is not just a matter of so a few individuals, bad apples, who are propagating some sort of racist ideology. It was literally built into everyday life. And all the institutions worked according to it, right? They all did. The economy, government, education, everyday consumption, eating of, eating of food, right? <coughs> Use of public utilities. All of these things were organized around this. It was literally built into the structure, and the little patterns, the staple patterns, right, of interaction between human beings on an everyday basis. So sin can reach that very point. You can see here in many ways right now, in some ways, the, own, right, the, the work of Jesus of Nazareth addresses all three of these, right, in a very, very powerful way. But think, okay, this suffering and this level of evil, it can be institutionalized. It can be completely structural, it can be social, it can be personal. When that suffering hits us, what does it do? What does it, what does it do to us? Let's go ahead and turn to Job, which in this case, right, is one that the Job sort of in some cases, blindsided him. In some cases, another, but in this case, this is not a rhetorical question. I, I ask, when somebody undergoes major suffering, how do they respond? What is the possible response? What do we know? All right, try to look for a cause. It said, shut down. Okay, it's completely shut down. Actually, just here. Olivia? Anger gets shut down. Is there withdrawal? Is that what you? Yes. All right. Explanation. That's the question of why. passage about Paul, because uh, at, at times, right, Paul has been used almost uh, as, a, uh, as a kind of puppet uh, for an easy providentialism, right, mm -hmm. that if something terrible occurs, just smile through it. <laughs> just simply smile through it and say, God is good, I rejoice, um, without necessarily at least either admitting or wanting to express any of these other things. Because I can tell someone to the exclusion of those. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's not one hand, I believe. One more, yeah. Despair. Despair, yes. Mm. All right. I think it's important to identify, first and foremost, kind of the, the characteristic effect, right, of suffering. And I think for sure we identified some of these right off. When we suffer a certain way, we withdraw from people. Right, we disconnect. Right, that's one of the possible consequences. Right, that in some ways here you can always see, in, right, goes against or against the grain of our own creational, right, providence. Mm -hmm. That we're, we are actually by nature connected to others. To suffer and then cut ourselves off or withdraw from others is already another blow, right, to ourselves as, a, as, as created beings. So we have that withdrawal that's real, right? We will withdraw, other things happen. Right, we become isolated, maybe even alienated. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, some of these other emotional issues come in. There's a serious anger. And usually it's anger in that I don't know how to make sense of this. Right? It's the senselessness of the suffering that probably hurts more than what perhaps somebody did. Right? Yeah. Or did not do. Yeah. Right? It's the senselessness of it. 
Now, in some cases, and some get right here where we have maybe interpersonal conflicts and we suffer through those, we actually can engage those folks, even if we don't even understand why we're hurting each other. <laughs> right? We'll somehow work through it. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, there are other forms of suffering that are, in this case, primarily social and structural, where people can't point to that person and say, that person did it to me. Right? In some ways, they have to point to a lot of people uh, in order to make sense of it all. And that may be right, those that, that hurt the most. Right? All of these right, may hurt uh, more, than, more than any other. But there is a cry. Why is this happening to me? Why is this occurring? Uh, right? There is also, of course, the point here of rejoicing. That could be one attitude that says, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to somehow celebrate this. One other possibility, in terms of a response, passive resignation. Oh well. This is just the way life is. Always happens to me. Or always happens to us. If that happens to be a collective matter. And we'll just have to wait, I guess. We'll have to wait until God does something. We'll have to wait. Um, we'll have to wait until we die. And perhaps find redemption then. Perhaps that's the answer. Perhaps that's the theological argument that makes more sense. Right? Now there was a major, right, there, there was major backlash to positions like that, uh, which are, are definitely tied to this kind of easy providentialism, right, that God will send these scourges of suffering, you won't be able to explain them, don't even try to explain them, because in God's good providence, he knows what he's doing. Now, you can see obviously on the one hand here that it affirms God. And it should. On the other, it leaves us uneasy because we wonder, why can't I get some kind of response or some kind of understanding to this? Something that shows me, right, what God is doing in the big picture. Right? And this, this part is, of course, quite difficult, right, to resign ourselves passively to this. This is precisely actually what Karl Marx had had, right, in, in his own critiques in his early writings in the early right, 19th century. Um, right? He stated, that these folks have real-world problems, and they generate symbolic solutions for them, instead of having real-world problems with real-world solutions. Uh, so, of course, to him, he thought that this is simply a form of escapism, right? And hence his argument that it was the opium of the people, the sigh of the distressed creature, the spirit of a spiritless world, right? For him, it says this is precisely what a world where people do not want to look at reality come up with something to escape it, hmm. and not ever actually engage it for real. Right? And I don't think, right, and, it's like, and in many ways, right, there have been a lot of currents in Christian theology that have definitely justified that criticism. Right? Where faith is seen more as something that will help you escape suffering, rather than live in it and engage it. Hmm. And of course, again, I think here there's a concrete example. Jesus does not seem to me to be the type of figure who was an escapist. Mm -hmm. right? He engaged reality in actually its dirtiest and most harmful, right? without any reserve. But this kind of passive surrender to the providence of God, I just don't think it holds water. And this is me personally. Mm -hmm. It's hard for, of course, you can see the arguments that would tumble something like this or seriously challenge it. The Holocaust. Right? All spirituality and theology changed after the Holocaust. It's hard to justify a universal good coming out of exterminating six million people. Right? And even before that started, placing children with Down syndrome inside of trucks and gassing them. In the name right, of, in that case, medical necessity, right, or some kind of, I guess, what we seem to be a certain level of mercy. Right? And, right, and, and, and you can obviously see, right, in some cases there, certain even forms, of, in that, well, in that particular case, there's almost like a form of scientific racism, right? They wanted to weed out, right, anybody that could actually transmit defective genes hmm. to a subsequent generation, kill them now at a young age, or sterilize their parents. And I read, I literally, yesterday, I was in my library at my institution, there was a book in the library called the Third Reich Source Book, and I read several articles, uh, right, that were recovered um, from a library of the Gestapo 
where they had memos about different procedures that they had carried out, sterilizing procedures that they had carried out in different people. Uh, and in that case, and there was one, one of the articles uh, that was in that source book justified it in the name of Christian faith as an act of mercy. Right? So in many ways, right, it is true that there is an element right, where certain aspects of science and technology have given us the opportunity to try to avoid suffering and even almost even try to control suffering in the future by eliminating right, people now. Right, uh, there, there was one article that I read several years ago that, uh, with that, that where one French commentator, he wrote this out of Paris, who, who argued that the amount of abortions that he hears about, right, in cases where the child has been, uh, uh, where the fetus has been identified as a potential Down syndrome risk, um, is so alarming, he said, that perhaps it means that the next generation will have no Down syndrome births in the entire country of France. And when I showed this article, uh, to a youngster who works in special education over at the college, uh, he said he then took it and showed it to one of the youngsters that he works with at a school there, at a learning center, uh, who has Downs, and he said, this doesn't make me feel very welcomed in the world. Right, so what's interesting here, of course, is that even potential solutions to suffering only increase it. Or try to completely disregard it and move around it. Or explain it away as that's God's providence. Right? Out of this limited atrocity, a great universal good will be achieved. But it's very, very hard to argue that. Right? Out of that, that level of death. And in particular, of course, any that revolve around what we consider to be suffering of innocent children. Right? But we know, of course, that God, God, God is capable right, of doing all sorts of things. In fact, let's go to this passage on rejoicing. Uh, that was mentioned before right, by, one of, by one of our participants uh, right, in Philippians. Now, interestingly enough, right, we know that in Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, rejoice! Right? These people for sure were suffering. But it says uh, in Philippians 4.4, 4, in fact, I can fly through numerous, uh, right, numerous, I uh, have memorize a lot of these from, <laughs> with all of you. Um, Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. We know, of course, in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, he says the same thing. Actually, there he says rejoice always, right? Um, in Romans 12.15, I'll read that one. This is actually fairly interesting, um, a fairly interesting instance. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. If there's rejoicing going on, let's rejoice. If there's mourning going on, we ought to mourn. It doesn't say, rejoice with those who rejoice. And if they're mourning, get them to rejoice. <laughs> You're still mourning. Entire book of the Bible, Lamentation. Learn how to lament, right? Which is something that we'll talk about um, right, a little later on. But what's interesting, of course, here is that passages like this, Philippians 4.4, 4, 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Romans 12.15, right? It's remarkable, even in the case of Philippians, he's writing the letter from jail. Yeah. <clears throat> right? He's writing the letter from jail. Numerous times, right, Paul right, asserts, I am struggling. This is hard. I have been harmed in many, many, many ways. Right? To, to strip all of these passages and then stick them into an easy providence of God. Right? And say, look, if anything happens to you that's bad, just smile through it. Because it says rejoice always. It says it right there in the passage. But to strip it out of its context, which is written by somebody who expects the people he's writing to to live by the way of the cross. Right, to be people who are willing to actually suffer with other people. That changes the meaning of the passage in a lot of ways. They touch it. Right, this is somebody who, right, in one sense saying rejoice, rejoice always, but then in Colossians 1.24 saying, I fill up in my flesh what's lacking with regards to Christ's afflictions. It's somebody who knew that, yes, there is suffering that I have to actually engage. And I won't be able to explain away God's providence. Right? 
In 1 Peter, there's several allusions there, the same thing. You will have to suffer through this for a while. But you will rely on God. And, and he will give grace to the humble. Like to those who have bowed down. So in all these cases, they didn't try and easy out with God's providence. Oh, it's okay. Somehow, through this whole thing, God is making sure that you go through this. Now, we know that suffering for sure will test our faith. All I'm saying here is that there's no easy providential answer right, to all of this stuff. I lost my job. It must have been God's will. I found this parking place. That is God's will. <laughs> that phone didn't work. That was God's will. I found this candy bar next to my little, to, to, to my book. That must be God's will. Okay, picking out in some sense God's will in micro situations, yes, we're looking for God's will. But think that he's transmitting this God's will every single second, literally for the finding of your parking spaces, right, to these other things is a little harder, right, to claim with confidence. And this is more so not an issue of God is not powerful and is not directing us with his will. But at the same time, God is not also a micromanager and we're trying to control him. <laughs> right, in return. That, that's not, I think, what God is after in any of these places. So if the response in this case that I'm challenging is one that is not one of passive resignation and surrender, but is another one. It's another plan. It's another path to walk. And I think this is one where we can uh, approach Job and tackle a few of his responses. There's, I think, a few scriptural responses that are important. Now, before we do that, that's not the issue of suffering. In fact, if Lamentations was not enough, um, and any of the Psalms, just about, uh, would not be enough to let you know that um, the Hebrew people or the covenant people were not the sorts of people who did not wanted to avoid suffering, but in a sense wanted to very much process it. Um, wanted to sing about it, wanted to speak about it, wanted to pray about it. Um, the book of Job is one very long and beautifully poetic uh, piece of engagement with the question of unjust suffering or senseless suffering, right? And in this case, we, we may call it a form of imposed suffering. Um, and uh, you can actually see even right off the bat that there's that, that, that level of gratuitousness and excess is there. Um, from the very beginning, even in his life. I mean, if you considering that in this case, Satan, who in this case is working as a prosecutor, uh, as an adversary, um, and wants to roam about the earth and find wrongdoers and identify them to God. Uh, and in this case, of course, wants to prove to God that Job's faith is not disinterested. In the sense that Job's faith is really only there and really only substance, uh, of some sort of substance because God gives him things. Because God has provided, right, a certain level of wealth and comfort in his life. Right? But uh, Job uh, is challenged right, by God's confidence in him that this is not the case and he will prove it to be so. Now, one of the very first things that occurs after, you know, clearly we can actually take an entire semester to study the book of Job. Um, so in this case, we're definitely doing the short, short version uh, of Job. One of the main issues that Job needs to confront, and the book of Job confronts, is this theory of temporal retribution, or of divine retribution. And it's, it's I think, stated quite clearly right down here in the bottom. The wicked live tormented lives, but the upright are rewarded with happiness and plenty. This is actually, in short, the argument that Job's three friends repeat in numerous different ways to Job. You have messed up. You had to have messed up. Mm -hmm. You were sitting out of your eyeballs, out of your ears. You had to have been, because God is completely just and he would not have, right? smitten somebody who was completely innocent. Now, of course, we know from many, many other psalms, <laughs> or even Re Revelation 6, why, oh God, do the wicked reign? Right? And like Psalm 17, why? Why, do, why? why are they comfortable doing what it is that they're doing? 
Take your pick of just about any passage in the Latter Prophets. Right? Yeah. Habakkuk 1, verse 2, the verse, second verse of Habakkuk. Why, God? Why? Why is it going so well for these people who are harming you? Right? Or who are disregarding their own brothers and sisters of the covenant? Right? By the building up their lives and taking advantage of others. Right? He's asking this question, and of course, at the center of it all, of Job, it's, uh, it's one question that he asks. The theory of divine retribution. This is what his friends want to push on him. Right? But it's wearisome repetition characterizes these sorry comforters. If you go ahead to right, Job 13, 4, right, we see what he's stating. My eyes have seen all this. My ears have heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you, but I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. You, however, smear me with lies. You are all worthless physicians. All of you. If only you would be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. <laughs> Job doesn't like their response, does he? <laughs> right? And notice here, right, he is very bold. He says, I want to take this to God. I'm not try he is not trying to avoid God. I want to take this to him. I want him to hear me out. I was living this kind of life. I had this, I was thinking, what am I missing here? And as you read through Job, and of course the challenge here is as you take your time to read through Job, you'll notice that Job changes. He comes to certain realizations. And then there's obviously the 4th of July version of the realizations that come in in Job 38 uh, with God's assistance. Um, but before God comes into the picture, he comes to a number of realizations just through his dialogue with his friends. Right, which is actually a very, very important point that sometimes gets left out. Right, he's actually talking through this with his friends. They're pushing the theory of temporal retribution, but he is actually restating his position over and over and over again. Now, if that particular right reply to his friends weren't enough, he also uses this point in, the next, in the chapter 15 when Eliphaz wants to respond, right, that, um, that he's filled with windy arguments. Actually, the, Eliphaz's argument is, is very clear. The, Eliphaz, the Tenonite, um, Temanite, sorry, replied, Would a wise man answer with empty notions or fill his belly with the hot east wind? Would he argue with useless words, with speeches that have no value? But you even undermine piety and hinder devotion to God. Now he's insulting Job here. Your sin prompts your mouth. You adopt the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you, not mine. Your own lips testify against you. And so in this case, he's telling him, you got to watch it, Job. Asking God to hear you out. It's like you're challenging him. Mm. You're going after him. You're getting up in God's face. How could you do that? Right? And, and he actually, right, even though we didn't read it, the chapter before, and the, and the couple of chapters before, right, Job's reply is that all of your arguments are like wind. They're in here and out the other. They don't amount to anything, is what he means. Right? They should be solid. Right? They should actually stick to something. Right? They should fall on the ground. You should be able to, right? Almost, to, and they have to be something solid to work with. He says, all your arguments are not any of that. Which is actually a very, very important point when it comes to even engaging something that, right, you, to engaging suffering. And one of them is not to come up with arguments for justifying why you're, why you're suffering. In a sense, not just these arguments that easily justify what's going on. Right? And in this case, of course, these are his friends are trying to help him, but they're simply posing arguments as opposed to being there with him, which is different. Right? In the end, we'll actually see that actually one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, and why he's called Paraclesis, which means stand beside. Right? But in this case, right, we find this is just not enough. They're sorry comforters. They're filling the air with all these really sophisticated arguments about God's providence. And it doesn't actually help Job at all. It does not help him, right, through any of this. Right, over in right, 16.4, I, I also could speak like you if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you, but my mouth would encourage you, comfort my, from my lips would bring you relief. Right, so in this case, he also says, those kind of empty arguments come from people who don't want to feel it anymore. They don't want to feel the pain with you. Right? 
and would know how that feels. I unfortunately have probably done it in too many of my friends <laughs> in my lifetime. I wanted to come up with a good argument, but instead I just didn't want to, I actually have not let, felt their abandonment or that their level of pain. In that case, I shouldn't have actually filled the air with anything. Which is precisely what Jill tells me, because it actually would be good if you just shut up. <laughs> right? It'd be good if you simply be quiet. Just be here. Rather than trying to come up with these providential arguments. Right? To justify what's happening to me. So that's what it says there in verse 4. As this progresses, we see several realizations. 16, 2, verse 6, which we read, we read this part a little bit further down. It says, but my mouth would encourage you, verse 6, yet if I speak, my pain is not relieved, and if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, O oh God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have bound me and have become a witness. My godness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. I mean, this is, he's definitely freely expressing how he feels. Uh, and it is quite tough, no doubt about it. But as it says, that, you know, even in the slide that's here, right, immersion is really very much required. Right? If we want to, right, and this gets to is not glorifying pain, by the way, uh, or glorifying suffering, I should say. It's honestly dealing with it. There's a difference between romanticizing it and glorifying it as, ah, the more suffering I feel, the better. Right? I remember reading a quote from a, from a, a chaplain during the Civil War. Southern chaplain who actually told a group of soldiers, we haven't suffered enough to deserve the, war, the, the victory of the war. That's actually a very good example of glorifying suffering. Right? Whereas here, this is not the case here. This is simply a matter of, let me truly engage it as it should be. Right? And even the, the last mention here, there are, there are at times where I have, in many ways, right, I've been almost dishonest about God to defend him. Right? I've come up with something that kind of defends God, but in many ways what it shows is you are dumb and don't know what you're talking about, and God knows everything that's good and just doesn't want to tell you. That's kind of what is conveyed to this person. Right? But we, we certainly, if we don't know what we're talking about, it's better to not say anything in the face of suffering. Right? It's better to not say anything. Because otherwise, we'll actually, in some ways, be speaking on God's behalf with God all the while saying, what in the world are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have said that. Why are you saying that? Did I tell you that? I tell you that. Okay? That, that, that's how it would come off. How it's most, right? But you can see, God, I mean, Job does run a risk here to the point where he says, man, it feels like God is gnashing me with his teeth. He's nasty. He's, he's literally eating me up, is how it feels. But he always sticks with God. I mean, we see this example of the Juarez feminicides in uh, Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. The level of pain involved with these. I've met uh, several women um, who lost their, ch their daughters disappeared. Uh, there have been several hundred murders in the past 20 years. The vast majority of them unsolved. The vast majority of them uninvestigated. Uh, and a very good example of how sin is not just simply at the personal level, but runs straight through, right, the social and structural level. Anyone who's suffering harm, or any group of people that are suffering harm over, over a prolonged period in the United States or in any country, that really is only possible if the sin has actually reached such a level that it is the kind that is mentioned you know, in Exodus 1 and 2, or even in Genesis 4, the blood of Abel is crying out to God, protesting and calling, and God is saying, I hear you. This should not be happening. Right? I mean, the Juarez feminicides, I mean, you see that you can find these posters if you walk around certain areas of the Juarez or Chihuahua area, right? And you find sometimes posters with about 40 women on them. Right? You can even see the name there. Ayúdanos, los estamos buscando. Help us, we're looking for them. Some of these women are found, only a leg or an arm left. Right? Usually uh, killed and then buried with limbs deliberately exposed out in the desert. Uh, a good bit of them are assaulted on their way back from a maquiladora, from one of the factories there, um, most of which kind of Western company run, uh, and so forth, that are coming back from some of these ships. And uh, a good bit of them are drug dealers who, after a successful delivery, on their way back, they find one of these women, and they brutally attack them, rape them, and mutilate them, as almost as a trophy. They 
you think at what level, right, of apathy and indifference, right, and even hatred, could something like that occur not just once or twice, but hundreds of times over the course of several decades? And just perhaps in the past year and a half, two years, they've started to actually make headway. And most of these are the mothers of these women. Right? So this is something that right, is, uh, is, is, very, is very pressing in the world. This is where they, uh, they erect these pink crosses, where they find bodies. Sometimes there'll be several women that are all dumped uh, in a public place or in a place all at once. Um, right? So you see, for, for Job, as for something like this, and I simply show this, so that, you know, so the hearts are softened uh, before something that, for Job, is supposed to be a very personal experience. And the first step that he realizes uh, is that if we're going to draw near to God, it does actually involve pain for others mm -hmm. and with others. That's actually part of the deal. That's part of the path. Otherwise, we remain untouched comforts, as it says there. Right? We remain very much untouched. And this doesn't mean then go out of here today and go look for suffering for yourselves and then say, now I know how that feels. Let me go find somebody who's going through the exact same thing. Right? Many of us have already gone through enough that we know we can share it with others. Right? But the whole point is that it says that this is something that is, that is important. And to Job, he realized this is at the center of it all. I, and as you read through, especially the, after this portion of Job, um, into chapters 20, 21, uh, even 19, 23, you start realizing that Job is now looking at other people, not himself. Mm -hmm. He's now focusing on the pain of others, and so he realizes, I am going to be committed, not just to figuring out why I'm going through this, I'm going to be committed to others too. Because in that sense, he knows, he knows that that's real. You know? I, I know that this is right here in front of my face, and it's not just me, it's a lot of other people. And I have to also be on their side. So it says here, we can't justify God by condemning the innocent. Right? It can very much lead to contempt for other people. Right? Where we feel as if, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I, do, I'm just, I just have to defend God all the time. Hopefully that makes sense. I moved ahead. There we go. Right, it's important to broaden. That, that's one of the things that, that Job discovers. I have to broaden my perspective. He realizes, man, I'm not alone in this. I am actually going through things that a whole lot of other people are going through too. And that is one of the most important things about understanding suffering and processing suffering. Not coming up with a great argument to explain why you're going through it, but going through it with others. Right? Sharing it. The complete opposite of withdrawal and isolation and alienation. Right? Which in some cases, that's what some specially designed torture right, is supposed to generate. Isolated people. Right? There's been post-suffering during the Pinochet regime in Peru, and that the type of torture under Pinochet regime was specifically designed <coughs> to atomize the citizenry, to turn them into little atoms who are mutually distrustful of one another. Right? They would be kidnapped during the day by plain clothesmen, knocked out, woken up, deliberately torn down, not fed, right, to the point of death, exposed to the elements, and then just at the point of death, they spoke sweetly to them, fed them, and then brought them back up. Built them back up to the point where once they were back to health, they knocked them out again, and then dropped them back off where they had originally kidnapped them. All the while, of course, from that, day on, from that day forward, the person walking about the city, who kidnapped them? I'm not going to say anything critical about the government. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to share anything with anybody. I'm not going to expose what I think about anything to anybody. That's it. That's a very, very powerful way. Mm -hmm. right, of making someone, in a sense, almost codependent, right, in that regime, but they're not ever wanting to express anything openly to anybody. Because you don't know what this person was part of that group of people who did that. Right? This really happened. <laughs> right? That, that level right, of, of atrocity. But he says that his Job's focus is that I have to remember these other people. The suffering um, of others. Come on over. There we go. Right? And now it actually takes on a completely different nature. Okay? And I'll read 
glad we'll read a passage here. I'm just going to work uh, through this so we can get out to some of these right, some of these passages here. You can see what he explores in 21. I'll read one verse here, uh, 21, 6 through 9, with, with Joe's reply. Oops. When I think about this, I'm terrified. Trembling seizes my body. Why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? They see their children established around them, their offspring before their eyes. Their homes are safe and free from fear. The rod of God is not upon them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows plow and uh, do not miscarry. They send forth their children as a flock. He's trying to explore. Why are all these things going so well? Uh, brothers, in verse uh, 13, they spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace. Okay? Later on, right, he again, later on in chapter 21, he, he, he again, he dismisses the arguments uh, from his friends that try to justify that, no, these, those people are actually doing well, and that's why they prosper. Job says, no, that's not the case. The reason why, right, as we go to chapter, uh, chapter 24, the reason why is because there's all these other people who don't care about their neighbor, who don't care about their brother, who don't care about their sister, and that's why they're suffering. He realizes this isn't God doing this stuff to me. We're doing this to one another. Right? And he said, and he realized, and of course he realizes, why God? Right? He's asking, why is this happening? Job 24 details quite a bit of these. Right? So it says in verse 24, Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? Men move boundary stones. They pasture flocks they have stolen. They drive away the orphan's donkey and take the widow's ox and pledge. They thrust the needy from the path and force all the poor of the land into hiding. Like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go out about their labor, labor of foraging food. The wasteland provides food for their children. They gather fodder in the fields and glean in the vineyards of the wicked. <coughs> Lacking clothes, they spend the night naked. They have nothing to cover themselves in the cold. Right? In the end here, and then it, uh, over in verse 8, 15, the eye of the adulterer watches for dust. He thinks, no, I will see me. Right? The whole while, he, he, this is a very different tone from it, what, from it is in the beginning of Job, when he's thinking about himself. Now he's wondering, God, look at all these people. This poor person, the person took his coat, and now he's sleeping naked at night. Didn't give him his coat back. Look at this person over here, has to send his children out to forage for food out in the wilderness. But there's food right over here. Why is it, what, what's going on? Right? He doesn't realize, what is, what is going on? This is something so terrible. And obviously, one of the clear things is that apathy is so powerful. Right? Apathy is very powerful. I'll skip this for a moment, but I think right, this is one of the things that becomes clear to him, is that apathy is tremendous. And instead, right, what we need, as he says, as he moves forward, right, he realizes, man, I want God to be my guardian. I want to be filled with compassion. And I want to have a vision for what, how God works in the world and the type of world that God made. In some ways, he's almost, he's harking back to Genesis. Right? He's wondering, I want to get a grip with who God is. And unfortunately, we can't read some of these things, but we most certainly do. Because Job comes across right, some pretty amazing um, right, realizations. And he, and he commits himself, I am going to address this stuff. Rather than trying to explain it as why God is doing this, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to, in my own compassion and action, I'm going to do something about it. And that's actually where it comes right here to us. What kind of attitude, what kind of mindset, what kind of faith, and all these together, what kind of action right, is needed to not necessarily sink back think, and think of what argumentation will justify God's existence in the face of this evil. It's who am I in the face of this evil? I hope that makes sense. Right, in some ways, it's, kind of, it's captured by that, by that, you know, by, by a, a, a great old saying. Uh, I think you know, uh, a reporter, I believe, from England once approached Mother Teresa and said, "Last night, a, a ten-year-old girl died by herself in a cold room in Calcutta. Where was God?" And her response was, "Where were you?" <laughs> right, where, where were you? Right. All the while here, there's our other passages uh, that, as, I, as I have it indicated here, he wants to, he said, I answered the cries of the others. There's obviously a very moving passage that maybe some of us have read where he says, I was the eyes to the blind, right? I was, um, 
I, I, was, I was a fiend to the lame. I, I, I clothed the naked, right? Job, Job is saying to God, when I noticed this stuff, I started doing it. I started acting on it. Rather than just simply questioning you and asking you and, and, and praying to you, I also did write something about it. I let my heart express love and compassion. That's what I wanted to do. His friends try one more, <laughs> one more attempt before the grand finale. Mr. Elihu shows up, and he doesn't want to also answer this question. He, doesn't, he completely avoids the source and the cause of the suffering, but addresses the why, and he goes back to divine providence. And his answer, actually, to him, is one that's, that's it's fairly interesting. Uh, right? In verse 1, he says, But now, Job, listen to my words. Pay attention to everything I say. I'm about to open my mouth. My words are on the tip of my tongue. My words come from an upright heart. My lips sincerely speak what I know. He's basically telling him, I'm spiritual. Listen to me. <laughs> the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. He's still pressing that same point. And verse 12 is key. But I tell you, in this you are not right. For God is greater than man. Why do you complain to him that he answers none of man's words? For God does speak, now one way, now another. Though man may not perceive it in a dream and a vision of night, when deep sleep falls on men as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings, to turn man from wrongdoing, to keep him from pride, to preserve his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. Or a man may be chastened on a bed of pain, with constant distress in his bones, so that his very being brings, uh, finds food repulsive and his soul loathes the choicest meals. His flesh wastes away to nothing, and his bones once hidden now stick out. His soul draws near to the pit, and his life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel on his side as a mediator, one out of a thousand, to tell a man what is right for him, to be gracious to him and say, Spare him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom for him. Then his life, then his flesh is renewed like a child's. It is restored as in the days of his youth. He prays to God and finds favor with him. He sees God's face and shouts for joy. He was restored by God to his righteous state, and he comes to men and says, I sinned and perverted what was right, but I did not get what I deserved. He redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and I will live to enjoy the life. God does all these things to a man, twice, even three times, to turn back his soul from the pit, that the light of life may shine on him. Pay attention, Job, listen to me. Be silent, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak up. For I want you to be clear. But if not, then listen to me. Be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. <laughs> okay, later on in chapter 34, verse 4, let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. Job said, I am innocent, but God denies me justice. Although I am right, I am not cons I'm considered a liar. Although I am guiltless, his arrow inflicts an incurable wound. Now, what's most interesting here is that as he continues his argument, and it's a fairly lengthy one. Wow, it goes for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, it actually runs up right to the Lord's, pretty much the Lord's response. In chapter 36, one of the things that Elihu mentions is that only people that talk like you, Job, the people who speak like you, are the people who are actually doing wrong. It is only people who complain this much to God must be those who are actually taking advantage of the poor. And he actually says that. He says, only people who complain that much about God, that reflects their bad attitude, which means that they also have a very poor attitude towards their fellow neighbor, and therefore take advantage of them. Mm. Now notice, right, this is the type of book that you have to read carefully, because yeah. that's actually not incorrect, <laughs> right? The way that he's applying it to Job, I'm going to break the pen, um, right? The way that he applies it to Job is incorrect, yeah. right? Yeah. right? It, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't really apply to his situation. Right? The whole while here is that he's actually just trying to get Job to be quiet. To get back into his box and not. And maybe what he's trying to tell him is don't seek God anymore. Just sit down and resign yourself to this fate. Right? He, he doesn't. Eventually, of course, God says, I think I'm going to get in on this. <laughs> okay, which he does. And any abuses of providence, which we won't be able to talk about that, right, is clear. Right? God does good to the sufferers, and those who turn their backs on him or challenge him must be those that take advantage of the innocent. That's the point that I made. Uh, he makes that somewhat clear in 34 and then later on. Right? But one of the things, of course, that he learns here is that right, these friends are simply talking about God. Job is actually talking to God. And that's one of the things that sometimes is lost in the reading of Job. Rarely, actually, not, do, do these friends never actually say, let's pray to God together. Let's talk to God together. 
It's, I'm going to tell you what God's about. Mm. Right? So they talk about him, while Job is doing all the talking to him. <coughs> right? And with him. Right? Which again is a very important point, I think, that can be drawn or gleaned from a reading of Job. Now, if we move on over here to, to uh, chapter 38, okay, and I'll read uh, a, few, a few verses here. I'm, I'm actually going to jump around. I think some of us have probably read this before. It's usually the part of Job that's always read. It's just skip all the arguing. <laughs> I said, you know, said, let me get back. We read the first two chapters. Oh, man, Job is in a bad state. All right, skip all the stuff with his friend, blah, 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 blah. Look at God's response. Okay, here he comes. It's important to read all of it, okay? To, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get a, both actually to, to feel the impact of, of the, and also the beauty of, of the writing, um, and then also even to appreciate what God is after here. And in verse 38, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. A storm comes in, and he speaks out of that. <laughs> Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, I will question you, and you shall answer me. So all these risks that Job takes, he did cross the line numerous times. But he's answering. Rather than saying, you should listen to your friends. He doesn't address his friends, he addresses Job. Mm -hmm. Right? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Mm, that's a tough one to answer. <laughs> Tell me if you understand. Who marked up its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched the measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cor cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? I don't think he was around at that time. Verse 16, have you journeyed into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me, if you know all this, what is the way to the abode of light, and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their palaces? I mean, their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. <laughs> God is somewhat good here at sarcasm. In verse 31, can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? Or lead out the bear with its cubs? The answer is obviously no. <laughs> then over to verse 39, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Interestingly enough here, right, he jumps in verse 9, will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will he stay by your manger at night? Can you hold him to the furrow with a harness? Go to verse 13. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. Over to verse 26. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread his wings toward the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build his nest on high? He dwells in a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is his stronghold. Right, when we continue reading this, right, there's other, of course, uh, even in between the verses that I read towards the end, you can't help but wonder, God, what does a hawk, an ostrich, and an oxen have to do with Job's situation? Right? He basically gives him a tour of the zoo. <laughs> and this is supposed to answer and, and conclude a very, very lengthy, right, and poetic piece of argument about God's providence and mercy and compassion. And God tells him, have you ever seen an ostrich lay its eggs? <laughs> what are you talking about? And there's actually a tremendous point. Now, interesting enough, right, when you take a look at this and think about it, right, you see, He's taking him, he's giving him this view, right, of creation at Y. And most remarkably, a lot of the animals that he identifies here, human beings have very few dealings with. And in fact, don't immediately observe any of these behaviors. Right? Even in the Hebrew, I mean, even some of the goats that are mentioned in Mount Goats, human beings usually don't even ever see them. They know about them, but they don't see them having babies. Right? They don't see them actually doing much of anything human habitats are nowhere near these places. Right, so this is not just simply an issue of, Job, I know all about creation. You do not, because you're puny. Shut up. Right? This is not really what he's after. All of the stuff that he writes here at length are beautiful. They're good in their place. And time, he says, and God observes and sees them all. Right? He says, I see it all. 
seeing the rain. He says, you don't have any perspective on the rain. I know where the rain is coming from. I see the darkness. I see death. I see life. I see time. I see the future. I see these goats up in rocky crags and mountains where no human beings even want to hang out or go. And I see those animals. And they're giving birth. They're young. They're living their life. And they're dying. And it's good. And he says, there's life there. There's goodness there. So in the book, he's also, he, he tells him, he says, you are, he says, yes, you learn that it's not about simply me focusing on my suffering. Others are suffering here with me, and we're in this together. And not only that, we've actually caused some of our sufferings. We've caused these things. And I ought to be calling on God to answer me, and, and go for him, and go after him, and praise him, rather than just talk about him. But then God comes into the picture and says, this isn't even just about that about the whole expanse of creation here. He says, it is, there is a lot of goodness. Right? The Hebrew for tov, right, which is the one that's mentioned several times in Genesis 1. And tov, right, I mean, we translate it, and it was good. But the Hebrew term is like, it was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, it was fantabulous, it was awesome, it was amazing. Right? It's supposed to be, this is great. Right? Again, he's speaking, right, he's coming from that position of gratuity, right, of, of just complete excessive goodness, over-the-top love and grace and wisdom poured out into all of this. Right? And so once he hears that, Job says afterwards, I repent of this natural. Okay. I see it. There's all sorts of beauty and goodness that I, I didn't even address or see or even want to think about. Right? That's there. He doesn't deny his suffering, but of course his response is one that says, your perspective needs to widen even more and include me in it. And that's right. That's one of the great right, lessons that he that he learns there. Right, and all all his situation nods away at him, but he knows I have to find God. I mean, there's a few resolutions here before I then just read and mention a few things about Jesus, right, in his own ministry. The, the new right, the needs of it, others, right, can't be just left in suspension before we are completely clear about ourselves. Right, I still have to serve others. That's one of the things that I've learned from reading Job. Right? I can't put my life on pause and my service, right, and my heart of compassion for others on pause until I figure everything out perfectly and completely. Right? Job had obviously a lot of figuring out to do. He lost his family. <laughs> I mean, he lost his kids, lost the, well, lost his, I mean, all of his flocks. I mean, he lost a lot. Right? I mean, to the point where even his wife was telling him, you ought to curse God, right, and show him that you were interested in being blessed. Right? This is what he says. No, he says, we... Right? The needs of others can't be left in suspension until everything becomes clear. The commitment to the sufferers puts everything on a solid basis. It's located outside my individual world, and the needs of others there cannot be ignored. Right? The next slide here, right? We know, right? We know that this gratuitousness is that main characteristic of authentic faith in God. I mean, He's given it freely, He's given so much of it to everyone. Right? And therefore, God does know. Right? I mean, Job does know, right? and this is a passage that's also quite famous. I'm going to move ahead. Right? Where he knows, right? We actually have a song right? that we sing. I know that my Redeemer lives. And it's taken from Job. My Goel. I know that my God lives. Right? And, when I, and actually, when he mentions, right, when I die, I will see him in the flesh, or I will actually see him. He'll raise me up. I mean, he very much does put his faith completely in God. Now, what's the other response here when we move beyond Job and we see the ministry of Jesus? Jesus did not escape pain, right? But he saw very clearly that it causes isolation, it causes alienation, it causes manipulation, right? I can think of probably at least three or four words that also end in nation, and it would get the point across, right? But there's, there's, there's a number of things, of course, that needs to be done. When we think of the ministry of Jesus, we think of the ministry of reconciliation, right? We think of a mission of actually addressing the suffering straight on, right? Yeah. And, and here, you know, Luke 4. Come on, Gabe. I kind of end here. Right, we know this, uh, right, this passage quite, quite well. Where he stands up at Nazareth. There's actually this, this verse here that I'll read and then another in Luke in John 14, so that you know and look ahead. Um, 
I'll mention this one from Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Actually, another passage that kind of quickly comes to mind here in Mark. Come on, Gabe. I see one scripture, I think of another. It's a curse. Um, why, Lord, why? Um, in Mark 7, verse 31, I'll read this to you. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatma, which means be open. At this, this man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Suffering shuts people up, right? It closes off in withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Jesus gives them a voice. The very first and foremost thing, right, to work towards in suffering is to speak. To speak, to help, to give voice to the person suffering, rather than to close down. When the time is right, in the process, it's good to speak, to voice it, right? <coughs> right? And it's good to learn how to lament. There's an entire book of the Bible. Right? When we pray in the United States, we're not very good at lamenting. I think mean, that's completely true. My, my friend. Right? We don't know really how to process pain. We actually have a culture that actively tries to avoid it. Right? By and large. We don't have national days of repentance. We don't really have national days of grief. Right? We don't have collective days of identifying. There's a lot of people whose first sufferings have not been addressed for years. That's just the truth. We don't do that. But people of faith can do that. And will do that. Right? And, and so, you know, you often think, okay, Jesus himself was a sufferer. Right? He himself took that upon himself. Right? All of the sufferings of the people that he visited and that he loved came upon him. Right? And so we know then that this is a God who, as it says here, will come in the whirlwind but also a God who, in the Incarnation, shows that he's willing to take up everything that we do. Right? He takes it up. One of the many things that the crucifixion of Jesus does is that it reveals human beings who they are. It's like a mirror. Yeah. Right? And at times it asks a question from God. It's not just a really a question of theodicy. Can you justify God in a world of evil? It's an anthropodicy. It's also a question of can you justify human beings in a world of evil? When God looks at us, he says, I put my image in you. All of you collect you reflect me. So if you ask me, God, why is this happening? I ask you, why is this happening? I made you and entered your flesh to do this with you. Right? I mean, in some ways, this is what, what he's giving himself over. And Jesus himself reads, right? This is his purpose. Right? To do these, right? To carry out this mission. But he, even, even in Matthew 8, it actually says that when all the sick are following him, it quotes Isaiah 53. He took up our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Right? The scripture that we usually quote about the crucifixion, in Matthew, we quotes it as actually Jesus' ministry. His active ministry was to actually take right, this and live with these people. Right? And take all this upon himself. Right? And in this passage here, he gives them a voice. Right? This is so important. To give voice Right? And when there's voice, that means that I can actually share it with somebody else. I think, I think it was Colton who mentioned, right, if you feel insecure, right? You feel insecure, I don't want to question God and tell people that I'm, at, and that I'm struggling with God. But then once you actually enter a circle and you ask people, have you struggled, if, if, I just want to talk about it. Have you struggled with God? And they say, yeah. Like, oh, oh, you have? Oh, okay. Then I, I, I can share it. Right? And that's one of the great things that suffering can be done. Not only can it be spoken, but it can be shared with others. Right? That kind of solidarity makes all the difference. And when that solidarity is there, then reconciliation can also be there too. Right? Isn't it true that a lot of the suffering is usually a response to other suffering? 
Because I, I'm suffering because you brought pain to me, I'm going to bring pain to you. Completely bypass reconciliation and forgiveness. Right? And the power that it brings to transform not just our, our, ourselves and our relationships, but even entire populations, entire groups. When we bring this message, right, from our own faith, we're bringing it straight to the place of suffering. Right? To where it can actually mean something very, very, very powerful. Right? And if we go then down to John 14, why is it that when Jesus died, why did all the sins just sort of disappear? He died for the sins of the world, to take away the sins of the world. Why? Well, in John 14, 6, of course, respecting right, this freedom of human beings, we're respecting the freedom of creation, and the gratuity of creation. Right? We see in 14, 6, uh, Jesus says something very interesting. Um, we know this verse. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And he says, in verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? So then skip over to verse 15. If you love me, you will obey me, and you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now, that's mentioned again, I think, in uh, 16, verse 13. Um, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. Right? The term in counselor is paraclete. Paracletos. Para is besides. Places is called. Called beside you. But originally, it's supposed to be somebody who comes to court and speaks on your behalf, who's a witness. And in fact, some of the language here, Jesus says, when I die and I leave you, I will send the Spirit and he will testify on my behalf. He's basically, but he's speaking forensically. He's speaking in terms of the legal context. The Spirit will come and he'll fill everyone who wants it up, anyone who wants to, is of the truth and is seeking that justice or righteousness and peace for the world. He will tell you. He will show you the truth. He says, but I've got to go, and he'll come into all these bodies. I'm one body, but when the Spirit comes, it'll enter all the bodies of those that want the Spirit and seek it and are committed to it. And he said, he will be a paraclete. Right? He will stand beside, and he will speak. Right? In many ways, right, and it's funny that he says, I will send you another counselor. In some ways, right, Jesus says, I'm in one too. Yeah. Right? I've stood by him. It's like, you know, I've seen, one, I've seen one writer actually call them twins. <laughs> the Spirit and Jesus are twins. Right? So he said, but the Paracletus always stands by those who suffer. Because the Spirit suffered with Jesus. It was always there. It's the crucified Spirit. It's the wounded Spirit. It's a broken Spirit. Just like after Jesus dies and is resurrected, his wounds are still on his hands. He's still a broken Jesus, but he's raised and transfigured in his brokenness. It's good to know, right? In that case, there's no easy providential answer here. Our right, ability to transform history in our generation and this time is because we are people that are willing to enter and stand beside suffering. Right? Even that famous passage from Ephesians 6, right? Put on the armor of God. You don't put on the armor of God and run away from the struggle in the fight. You put it on so you can actually enter it. Right? And this is precisely right what Jesus did, isn't it? That, that is what he did in his own ministry, and that's why he sent the paraclete. If the paraclete stands by us, it's so that we can stand with and for and speak for others as well. Right? And that transforms the world completely. Just through one act of forgiveness, right? just through these acts right, of living a forgiven and reconciling life between ourselves and the relationships that we create in the world can actually address that suffering, right? It can absorb that suffering. In many ways, that's what the cross of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus does. It absorbs evil rather than reproducing it. Right? That's why it was a nonviolent, right, ministry. He repeatedly says when he's on trial, if I were, in John, he says, if, if my kingdom was of this world, my, my followers would be fighting for me right now. They'd be reproducing more suffering. That all of you are very good at doing anyway. And it's done just fine, actually. But that's what he tells us. He says before, uh, my father can send legions of angels to come over here and kick, kick tail, left, front, and center. No, I'm not going to do it that way. Told this guy to put 
the way the sword. The guy, one of the guys that came to arrest me, I healed his ear. Right? This is the way of Jesus. It absorbs the evil, just like right, Paul in Colossians 1.24. I'll take up the sufferings and spit out the grace. Right? That's power, isn't it? Yeah. It can make that much of a difference. Now, if you wouldn't mind here, with a little bit of extra time, would you? There is a link. I want you to see here. This is just simply a, one example, actually, of, of how the gesture here of, of um, actually, I have to change it, don't I? This is a, uh, a clip uh, from the work of uh, Libby Hoffman, uh, who tries to actually set up truth and reconciliation commissions in areas where they have been successful, right? In this case, uh, civil war um, or uh, right, intense uh, conflict and suffering. It is something very similar to this, of course, in Rwanda. Uh, but in this case, uh, this is something that she did in Ya chobo ho okara bo ya bala ya bo chobo de london na mpum ma ko bia yo ndo na me pwa he ki ma ko bia yo ndo ni a si nya no tu ma du mo la a ye bi moi me di si nya no ya ba me a no mo he ki me na a e a no na le I can't play alone, do my do, my my do, I may go for the man, I may be your party. The young girls are called Moo, if I bore ye young do, Monewa bore. You put down my you like when you call at the other Sunday, the child will limp you. You put the Sunday there, it is a. Then I can work through anything. 
Um, and in that case, you can see the power of reconciliation and forgiveness to not hide, right, or run around pain or suffering, but to actually deal with it and engage it directly um, is God's way, right? And it's the way of Jesus himself, and it's the way that will transform the world. Um, we commit ourselves to this. Thank you very much.